I have recently finished my PhD from the University of Sydney, Australia. I have worked on development of non-invasive cancer treatments to minimize harmful side effects of current cancer therapies and to make difference in lives of cancer patients. When I introduce myself like this, many people have questions like, what was your schooling like? You must have had access to resources while you're growing up and you must have graduated from top schools of India. But let me tell you, I'm from a very small place. This place is in Akola district of Maharashtra called Akot. Uh, and 32 years ago, when I started my family schooling there, the system of education was very simple there. I went to a, a public school and uh, we did not have any resources. And when I say resources, I do not mean laptop, computers, internet, or Wi Fi. I mean like basic facilities like desks, benches and electricity most of the time. So yeah, we used to sit on mad during our family schooling from year one to year seven and no complaints but because our teachers were great. They taught us everything that we need to know at that point of time. And as far as other kids are concerned, they were from very diverse background. And in fact, we had uh, some very poor kids coming to the school and they were not in a position that they would buy their own uniform or even bring their uh, meals fresh hot meals to the school. So school used to provide them uniform and provide them meals on everyday basis. So uh, that was a kind of environment, a very basic and humble environment I was growing up in. And uh, as far as my medium of study was concerned, I studied in Marathi medium until my year seven. And I was introduced to English when I turned 10 years old. In my year five, I was introduced to letter A, B, C, D, and English for the very first time and before that English meant nothing to me and at the end of my family schooling um, when I finished my year seven my understanding of English was very limited but I had to study science in English when I go in my high school in year eight because I always wanted to do a science degree and to do that it was important for me to know all the scientific concepts in English and I remember my first science lecture in my high school, when my teacher was teaching about electronic configuration, um, to, to spell it right and even to say it correctly was a big deal for me. Uh, and as a result, I struggled in my first term and my marks of science in first uh, term examination did not come out well. And I showed that mark sheet to my dad and he just smiled and he just said, find the solution. Neither he scored me nor not gave me a ready made solution. I, and I think it was his, uh, uh, his idea to make me uh, an in independent problem, problem solving person. And I'm so thankful for him to do that. So my solution was I wanted to find a science tutor. But back then in my small town, it was a big deal to find a tutor for a year eight student because um, there were only a few um, tuition classes there, unlike today. Uh, and uh, uh, people would only join them in their year 10 and 12 because those are like the most important years of their life. So I had to do a bit of the research. And um, after a long research, I found my tutor. And um, luckily, it was a very good uh, tutor. And um, used to go there every day. And uh, yeah, at the end of my final terms, my science mark was included. And after that, my education until year 10 went smooth. And when, when I um, finished my year 12, it was my time that I joined my uni and I always wanted to do a science degree and in, in specific health related science degree because I wanted to make difference uh, in lives of uh, people. So I wanted to do something in health related area. So I wanted to take admission in the pharmacy college, which was 45 kilometers away from my town. It was another town. But back then, um, in my society, in, in my community that I was living in, uh, it was not uh, very appropriate or very widely accepted that an 18-year-old girl leaves home and leave on her own for education uh, was not accepted. Um, and there was a bit of criticism and opposition from the ladies, friends, and families. But despite of all that, um, my dad um, listened to me. He, he trusted me, supported me, and... Um, he had a progressive thinking, so I got admission uh, in one of the big pharmacy colleges. And uh, when I go there, I realized that most of the people in the area where I was living in, in my community, in my society, had a similar thinking because there were only seven girls in a class of 60 students. So seven girls and 
53 point was the ratio uh, uh, there. So I uh, successfully finished my B pharmacy and M pharmacy and uh, everything, uh, all my education until my M farm uh, was um, in, in, a, in a town area of the India. I never lived in metro cities. So yeah, the environment has always been very humble and basic. So I come back um, after finishing my master's and um, joined one of the B pharmacy colleges uh, as a uh, full time factor, faculty lecturer. And that was also uh, a very small town where I worked. And uh, after that, uh, I, I got married after two years and my husband was settled in USA then. So I joined him after my marriage. Um, I was happy, but career wise, I felt so hopeless because. Um, Neither I had visa to work there, nor I had passed the entrance exams. And uh, my dream of becoming an independent person, my uh, dream of becoming a PhD was fading away. Yes, I wanted to do PhD because when I was doing MPharm, I had um, developed a research uh, interest, immense um, interest in research, and I wanted to pursue that. So my dream of becoming a PhD was fading away. Um, but my husband just told me that. Uh, prepare for the exam, and if you want to be ahead in the process, uh, just start approaching uh, professors, supervisors, potential supervisors. Uh, and I, uh, like full-time employee, used to go in library and sit there to, from nine to five, uh, and half a day I would spend preparing for my exam. The other half day I would just look for universities, uh, look for potential supervisors, have a read at what kind of research they are doing. And it was very uh, helpful to me. But several months passed, and um, I did not hear anything uh, from any supervisor. And I started to feel discouraged when I again thought that I, I might end up doing nothing in my life. And I was so sad. But then my husband told me, if it's not working, you have to try things differently and not give up. So I thought we thought together what I can do differently. So he said, maybe. Um, you have to show that your your readiness and you're more uh, interested in your, in pursuing your PhD. So why don't you start writing synopsis for your thesis? Why don't you write a proposal and why don't you uh, just um, show them what uh, uh, unique and ex exciting ideas you have for your field? And um, uh, I I it, it it sounded very easy to me earlier, but when I actually sat down to do it, and um, it was actually a difficult task because. I don't know um, what the PhD uh, proposal should look like. I did not have any direct support and guidance regarding this, and um, I didn't know what to include, what, what not to include. So um, uh, I felt like maybe I, I cannot do this, and I should ask my previous professors and my supervisors uh, for some help if they could send me something and I can get some influence from it. But I stopped myself from doing that because uh, I realized that I wanted to be a uh, independent researcher and an independent person, so I have to stop relying on other people. So um, uh, whatever it is, even if it's wrong, I have to own it. Um, so I started thinking about it, and I had this unique idea, I guess. I had immense interest in the herbal system of medicine, and I like advanced technology, and I always see them coming together, and that is making a lot of uh, difference in my field. Of medicine, so um, I put those ideas together, and uh, I see if my hypothesis is scientific logic, and I back it up with literature, and I started building up my small proposal or small synopsis, small thesis, and I started to sending it to everyone with my emails, and it made a difference. One fine day, within like three to four uh, weeks, uh, a professor from New, from New Zealand approached me. She said that. She's happy for me uh, to supervise me for my PhD if I think the university is requirement. And uh, she also told me that the idea is amazing and I have to stop sending it to others if, if I really want to pursue this. And uh, I'm fulfilling the university requirement and I started my PhD and my research journey started. So in the beginning, I was getting overwhelmed. You can imagine the kind of English we speak in a rural India and kind of English speaking proper English speaking country. So yeah, English was still a bit of an issue. Sometimes I had problem understanding people's accents and sometimes I struggled to explain myself very well, my ideas, but I stick to and days pass and um, I, I was in green every day. And at the end of my first year, 
I wrote my uh, first review article as a first author and everything was going fine, but we had any news. I was expecting, and um, it means I have to take a break. And this time I took like three years of a break because I wanted to look after myself and my baby. And after that, I wanted to come back to uni and uh, I again start approaching universities and supervisor. And I wanted to offer for a scholarship because I had a bit of a research experience now. I got scholarship because of my experience and I had uh, I had actually my publications as well. So um, I had my publications as well. So um, I got um, scholarships uh, and uh, I start my PhD once more uh, from the scratch. And I thought this time around, it will be so easy because um, I know what research is like now. I've been there and English is not that much of an issue for me now. So it should be easy. But this time, problem was different. I found it extremely difficult to send my child to doctor, to send my daughter to ch uh, childcare every day. Um, and uh, I had a separation anxiety, and it reflected in my first progress review, yearly review. And they wrote that I have done what I'm supposed to do, but I am. I don't feel like. But they don't feel like I'm very well connected to my environment. And I'm not that happy, and I don't need them again. They were actually ready. But I was equally saddened to see, see these comments because I didn't want it to see that on my record. And uh, and then I thought, maybe I cannot do it anymore. Um, and uh, there was such a strong mother in me, and it doesn't allow me to do anything else. Uh, so I acted discouraged, and I felt that I cannot make balance between my life and my work. Uh, but then um, I was again thinking, talking to myself, you will have three stories to tell to your next generation. One, that I had a scholarship, I had this beautiful opportunity, but um, I was a little bit uh, emotionally overwhelmed, so uh, I, I just gave up. Or other story would be, mom had a problem, and she had a scholarship, she had, she had a scholarship, she had this opportunity, but she had a bit of a problem, but she fell back. She tried to fix it and slowly finish her PhD and be role model for the next generation. And I actually chose that one. Um, and I decided I, I want to go back and I want to be my best. And at this time, I did not want any negative comments on my record. So I wanted to do my 100%. It was like a real comeback for me. And I uh, it was a little bit of an for me as well. And I wanted to fix things um, that I might have done wrong or that I might not have paid attention to, uh, attention to. So I started talking to other people about how I feel when I leave my daughter, you know, colleagues, friends and family, and I got a lot of support. And I fixed some small things in my life that I think I needed to do to, do to fix um, problems in my scenario. And the first thing was um, I wanted to do planning. Um, planning was lacking because there was so much on my plate. I had uh, kids to look after, I had my house to look after, I was teaching at the uni, I was doing research, so I wanted to be on top of it. So uh, planning was required and it was missing. And I planned my days, weeks and even months, even before go to bed, I would just visualize my whole day, go from one activity to another. It gave me readiness to my next day. And um, planning acted as a very solid roadmap for me to reach to my destination. Other thing was lacking was resilience. I was a bit less resilient earlier. I used to feel sad for hours after sending my child to uh, daycare. And uh, I used to feel sad if I, uh, by any chance, hear negative comments about my work. And uh, yeah, I used to come back to my little desk and would say, oh, I'm not fit for this environment. This is so advanced. I'm from a small place. And I used to feel so discouraged. But uh, I told myself uh, that, yes, as a human, it is OK to feel sad. And it's OK uh, to not move forward so quickly. But as a human, you also have a quality of resilience that you can bounce back to your own form and your own efficiency. And uh, you should develop that more. And with all my positive th thinking, I tried to um, uh, I develop my resilience. I tried to come back to my original form and shape. Uh, and I tried to be as effective as I was earlier, even more effective than earlier. So being more resilient and developing my um, resilience helped me a lot during my journey. The third thing I would like to say 
um, was crying. So yeah, we hear this word from our childhood and everybody knows that we have to try. But uh, when I had to actually apply crying in, in, in a very uncontrolled scenario, when, when things are hard for me, sometimes not um, the best uh, supporting environment I was in, in terms of um, uh, getting instruments or uh, any technical faults in the instrument, fixing that. Uh, the things were a little bit out of control, and I feel that they are too much hard for me to handle. In that scenario, I used to feel everyone around me is perfect. They're more refined and more ready for it. And I'm being from a very small place and um, being from a, a very humble background. Uh, I, I'm something less, but uh, it doesn't mean I should stop trying. And uh, once uh, the basic training is given, and once you know the safety of that tra training, uh, of, of that technique, it's it's you that you have to develop it. You have to learn it. And if you honestly give something a time, and if you come back to it consistently, that work itself will teach you how to do it. And you uh, cannot give up on it because you yourself is a great resource for yourself. In that scenario, you have to use that first, and then you have to think about um, the other things like, oh, this is new to me, I wasn't trained well, uh, and you have to remove all those mental blocks. The other thing I would like to emphasize here um, is start where you are. We all are product of our situation. Everyone has a different life, and everyone knows something better or something less, uh, or unfit. Um, uh, for the for the things that you want to do, uh, if you really want to achieve something, and if you feel like uh, you have something less, uh, don't think like that. Because um, whatever you have small, you can build upon that. And I use that analogy of mango tree and chickpea tree in my scenario. That mango tree is a big gracious tree and produces like most delicious um, flavor food and sweet fruits of all. Whereas the chickpea tree is a small dog tree, but it doesn't get intimidated by mango tree and then it stop um, producing its fruit. So yeah, chickpea has a um, very good contribution as far as uh, nutritional value is concerned. Um, and so is mango tree. So we, everyone has something unique in ourselves. We have these small things like a small bricks. Small bricks makes big building and uh, just like that you have to trust in those and start building upon that on that on that and that's why i would say small is big and never underestimate the power of small things thank you very much